Hi, I'm Chris Roselli. And I'm Rawa Haila Moriam. Welcome to Western Window, the show made for you by students at Western Washington University. In today's Western Window, we'll find out more about an important treaty gathering. We'll get a chance to talk to autism advocate Temple Grandin. And we'll find out more about Western student and all-time leading basketball scorer Jeffrey Parker. What, what? So stay with us as we explore our world through Western Window. Slam dunk! Jeffrey Parker. Three. <laughs> Temple Grandin didn't talk until she was three and a half years old, communicating instead by screaming, peeping, and humming. In 1950, she was diagnosed with autism and her parents were told she should be institutionalized. Today, she's a speaker who inspires and motivates others through her story. She recounts groping her way from the far side of darkness in her book, Emergence, labeled autistic. And we're lucky enough to have her in the studio. My name is Temple Grandin. I'm not like other people. You have a very special mind, you know that? Think of it as a door. A door that's going to open up onto a whole new world for you. Pick a subject. Cows? Do they have colleges with cows? Yes, they do. Mooing. You want to do research and write your masters on mooing. I can see a shoot just as a cattle will because that's something my autism lets me do. You wacko. I know my system will work because I've been through it a thousand times in my head. Miss Grandin, this is a masterpiece. I don't want my thoughts to die with me. I want to have done something. It's nothing short of a miracle. Dr. Temple Grandin is the most accomplished and well-known adult with autism in the world. Misunderstood as a child, she eventually found a mentor who recognized her interests and abilities. Grandin later developed her talents into a successful career as a livestock handling equipment designer, one of very few in the world. Grandin currently works as a professor of science at Colorado State University and speaks around the world on both autism and cattle handling. She has been featured on NPR and major television programs and has been written about in many national publications. She was included in Time Magazine's annual 2010 Time 100, which is a list of the world's most influential people. And today, I am thrilled to welcome you to Western Window. Thank Good you so to much be for here. coming. Boy, okay. I'm, I'm super excited, almost as excited as my wife, who is a third grade teacher, but I am extremely excited that you're here okay. in the studio. Great. So thank you very much for being here. Um, so uh, really just kind of get started. I mean, what are some of the, the misconceptions uh, that the general public has with autism? First of all, autism goes from Einstein, who had no language till age three. Thomas Edison was probably autistic. A lot of people in Silicon Valley, famous artists, to somebody who can't dress themselves. When they changed the guidelines in 2013, they made it in this huge, gigantic, big spectrum. Basically, on the high end of the spectrum, they're people that are socially awkward, but oftentimes really smart people. And when I was in elementary school, my mother always emphasized my ability in art. And that became the basis of my design business. I designed the uh, front ends of all the beef, Cargill beef plants in North America. And what I found when they were working on these big plants is that the industrial designers, the draftsmen, they lay out the whole entire complicated plant. Then the degreed engineer will do the boilers, the refrigeration, soil compaction, roof trusses, things of that sort. And then you got quirky guys in the shop that invent new equipment. And you need the whole team. Yeah. Well, the visual thinkers like me and the more mathematical pattern thinkers. That makes sense. So you've written books on... Uh... Oh, and I've got text. I've got uh, books on animal handling, I've got humane livestock handling. I've got another book coming out in April. It's called Temple Grandin's Guide for Working with Farm Animals for Small Producers. Wow. Although I have technical stuff on livestock handling, I've got journal articles, especially on my uh, measurement system for, for the slaughter plant supply chain management stuff. Okay. Um, my student back in the mid-90s was the first student to um, look at cattle temperament and weight gain. I said, let's just see if the cattle that get really wild 
uh, have lower weight gain. And when we did that in the mid-90s, that was radical stuff. Yeah. So you are, you've been called an inventor. You've been called a scientist. You are an expert in autism as well as farming. You've been called a rock star. Uh, you have now, uh, you're an author. Uh, what do you want to be remembered as? I want to say the kids that are quirky and different, the kids that are kind of like me, grow up and be successful. Get into great careers, like working for Boeing. There's a huge shortage right now of coders. There's a huge shortage of skilled trades. I've made a point now in my speaking engagements, I'll do a cattle thing for maybe the ranchers or FFA. I'll do a talk for an autism meeting. I'll do the general talks. I gave a talk at a, um, a, a industrial training conference, industrial design conference at Google. I like going back and forth between the different silos. Sure. Because I want to see these kids that are different not get stuck in a rut. I want to get them out, out there and help them be everything that they can be. Sure. So not everybody's had a movie made about them, uh, but there is one person in this room who has. You no, know, that was like a weird time machine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to ask. I mean, yeah, Claire Danes' Play You, which is really outstanding, received uh, pl plenty of awards, as a matter of fact. What was that experience like watching? It was really weird watching her. And uh, uh, Mick Jackson, the director, did a great job on it. They got my visual thinking right. They showed my projects accurately. I really liked the fact that my blueprints appeared in that movie. It showed the career stuff, and that I really liked. It also showed autism accurately, and the main characters like Ann and Mr. Carlock, they were shown really well, and he really was a NASA space scientist. That's really amazing. I mean, what a neat opportunity. So you say you see in pictures. This will be our last question. You say you see in pictures. What do you mean by that? It's associative. Like just today, when we, like, we had to jump over a puddle in the curb, and I saw a picture of something not nice that happened at the University of Illinois where there was a big mud puddle and a sidewalk this narrow with ice and stuff on it, and this car came over and deliberately <laughs> splashed me. And as I jumped over that little bit of icy water, I saw that picture where this car deliberately um, put the slush on me was not nice. That's associative. Yep. Now I'm seeing some other things. I stepped in in some other places, things that dogs left behind. <laughs> <laughs> you see, you see. then I got in the file of stuff I stepped in I didn't want to step in. Yeah. So you see those pictures? Yeah, they come up, they pop up like, uh, uh, sort of like slides that pop up. Sure, absolutely. Now what about non, uh, non things like love? Does it, do you get a picture in your head well, of like I'm a heart? Well, I'm seeing this LUV pickup I had. I'm seeing Herbie the love bug. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I'm seeing Loveland, Colorado. I know everybody gets their Valentine's postmarked there. Oh, right. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, good. Beatles song, love, love, love. <laughs> then I start to hear it. But the picture always comes up first. Interesting. Temple Grandin, it is an honor to have her here at Western. Thank you so much it's for coming on. It's great to be here. Appreciate it. First negotiated in 1964, the Columbia River Treaty is an agreement between Canada and the United States on the development and operation of dams in the Columbia River Basin. The dams are used for power and flood control in both countries. Now, 53 years later, the treaty is up for renewal and renegotiation. Recently, Western Washington University, in collaboration with Northwest Indian College, hosted a two-day symposium that brought together tribal and First Nations leaders, government representatives, non-government organizations, and academic and private industry experts to address the modernization of this very important agreement. The treaty and the whole power system was built on the concept of flood control and power. You know, that they're a tremendous battery. The battery fills up in the spring, summer, and then you drain it during the winter, and you fill it up in the spring and summer, and it's this renewable source that produces energy, and as you de dig the hole, provides flood control. 
ask what the challenges are to the ecosystem, well, first off, I have to look and say, well, this ecosystem, where is it? Well, it goes at least as far as the Aleutians, and because what this ecosystem is part of our ocean fisheries, it feeds our marine mammals, uh, endangered orcas out here, and right on up the Columbia River, and I could just list one, one ecological impact after another all the way up. These dams in the United States were built um, by the, uh, you know, by the federal government. And when they were authorized, uh, Congress did it under the principle of a federal objective, that their cost would not exceed the benefits, and, and so that there would always be a benefit to the national economy. You know, there's a lot of things that have changed since, you know, 50, 50 years ago in um, the 19. 60s and those kind of things and 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 some of them is the structure of of um, the ability and the conversation of governments I, you know when i first got my job one of the first conversations i had with one of our our elders on that was on the table on a child <coughs> council he said he said you know we made a decision because we saw that uh that the state and the feds and, and uh, and he, he said, the white man is not going to fix the salmon. It's a mighty hard row that our poor hand is holding. One of the biggest challenges for including ecosystem and making some of these changes is the, is the politics. And, and I don't think we, we talk about that enough. We, we talk about the environmental issues and how we, how we move them forward. But to move them forward, it's, it's through that, it's through that political, political system. And the ecosystem has been looked at as a cost to hydro and flood risk management, when, when in fact, over the last 100, 200 years, um, the development of these systems has been a cost to the ecosystem. And, and we understand the economics, and we're, we're, we're trying to incorporate all of that into, into where, we, where we go with this. But um, it's that paradigm shift. It's getting folks to to look at the environment, to look at some of these other issues in a different light. We worked in your orchards of peaches and prunes. We look back 50 years and we say, oh, those, those folks did a really good job at predicting uh, what was going to happen. It's not that they could predict what was going to happen, it's that they built flexibility into the treaty because they knew they couldn't predict it. And we don't know. We don't, climate change, we don't know exactly how it's going to materialize. Uh, in the basin, and we don't know what's going to happen with the California markets, and we don't know uh, what's going to happen to our load. And so we need to incorporate flexibility in there so that we can manage it as the values of our various countries change over time. Um, for us, home is, is the Columbia River. Um, we're not going anywhere. We've been here for thousands of years. The, the river is endured, we've endured. Um, when you've, um, you know, you've worked so hard to bring back something that was, that was taken that, that we, we get wrapped up in process and, and, and it, us and, you know, and I've, I've said this yesterday and I said it earlier today, you know, it ends up being um, us and them uh, as it relates to the treaty also. It's Canadian benefits, uh, U.S. benefits, upstream benefits, downstream benefits. We, we continue to look at the river in, 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 in that light and it's got us to where we are today. Um, I think we've heard a lot of um, opportunity. There's an opportunity for us today to change those things, to change that direction, to provide uh, a better future for, for all of us. We're all in this together. And, and I'm just very optimistic that there's opportunity and, and we need to take advantage of it. Well, the cliffs are solid granite and the valley is always green. This is just as close to heaven as my traveling feet have been. Senior Jeffrey Parker is the all-time leading scorer in Western Washington men's basketball history with 1,867 points. But the real success story isn't just the number of points, but the drive, determination, and family support that helped him break the record.
came. It was during the spring, spring quarter. Very sunny, it was hot, it was so hot. I'm like thinking, well, if it's like this every day, you know, I could come here, you know what I'm saying? You know, I was pretty much telling my dad, well, actually, uh, like uh, the visit, you know, I think I want to, you know, go to this, to this school. It's a very small setting. I feel comfortable. Then we made that decision, you know, let's commit to Western. My name is Jeffrey Parker. I'm from Oakland, California, and I play basketball at Western Washington University. My parents always told me the story of how they will hold me to the TV whenever Michael Jordan was playing. And they were like, oh, that's you, Jeffrey, that's you one day. You know, going into elementary school, when other kids are eating their lunch, I'm at the courts playing basketball. So I fell in love with it. It was really a getaway for me. It became home for me. Being into big groups like that, that just didn't really come to me. Basketball became like my friend, you know. I have this type of thing about me where I stayed in my shell, but it was my mom. She was the only one who understood me. She's the greatest woman I'll ever know. She would sacrifice, sacrifice for the whole entire family. She made sure we had food, you know, before herself. After redshirting in his first year on campus, Jeffrey burst onto the scene. In 28 total games, 16 of which he started, Jeffrey averaged almost 12 points a game and shot the ball with efficiency. He's been a second and first team Great Northwest Athletic Conference All-Star, as well as a Conference Player of the Week multiple times. Following a decorated three years, Jeffrey completed his junior campaign 469 points shy of Western's all-time scoring record. But going into his senior season, Jeffrey received news that could change everything. That day, I was at the airport. You now she was sending me back off to come here to Bellingham. And you know, I just remember hugging her. And that night, I just, everything felt weird, you know? It just didn't feel like right. Went outside, went to call my dad, told me what happened, that my mom passed away of a heart attack. You know, you just, in shock at that point, you know, yeah, wow, did this, is this really happening? Or, yeah, I just remember the first night, like, I'm just crying. I'm crying so much that it begins to hurt, like, I'm, I'm even starting to cough, because you just never feel like it's going to happen to you. As a human, like, you're not thinking about certain things. For me, I'm a senior, I'm getting ready to graduate. This is the last thing I'm thinking that's going to happen to me this year. My faith has pretty much been the thing that's getting me through. I'm at my lowest point now because, you know, she's not here. She's my best friend. She's not here. But I still know that God is with me. And as long as God is with me, I'm able to go through life. When something like that happens, you're just replaying it back, back again in your mind. And so when I get out on the court, those memories don't come up. Those things in your mind just don't come up. Jeffrey's final season, he helped lead the Vikings to the program's best record and first NCAA tournament appearance since his redshirt season. The Vikings won 25 games in GNAC regular season and tournament titles. Every game's pretty much been a highlight. You know, we're having fun out there, and the chemistry is very solid. On Friday, March 3rd, he rewrote Western's record books. With just over 15 minutes to go in the second half of the semifinal contest, Jeffrey caught a pass on the low block and went to work. family we're just all thinking like at some point mom's going to walk through the door but in reality she's not going to walk through the door it's very tough you know thinking about that you know when you lose your mom like well i could have done this more i wouldn't have you know said that at that time i love the game so much and i know how much my mom wanted me to pursue my dream in basketball so that's why i'm continuing to go on forth with it i have to keep going
The Bellingham Arts Academy for Youth, or BAY, is a unique nonprofit organization that enriches the lives of children through the exploration of the arts. Producing over 20 plays, concerts, and events, and engaging over 1,000 children ages 5 to 17 every year, Bay provides arts education throughout the community, and many of their instructors are Western alums and students. My name is Erica Ewell. My first degree is in musical theater performance. And I had just turned 21 and I graduated and I was like, this is all I've really ever been good at and I know that I like doing this, but I feel like I'm not really an adult and auditioning is a lot of work. And so I started teaching voice lessons to a coworker. Loved it, I just loved being in that in the teacher role um, and then decided to pursue music education. So I moved back up to Washington to go to Western for music ed. Just totally fell in love with it and decided this is where I want to be. And Western's program is really good about giving us opportunities to work in the schools with kids. And then one day I saw the Craigslist ad for an edge arts instructor and I was like, oh my gosh, like there's the opportunity to get in there and like put into action some of these things that I'm learning uh, in the classrooms. It's just, it's just the coolest thing ever. Like I work with kids every single day and I love it. <laughs> Today is the Bellingham Arts Academy for Youth. Uh, we are a uh, nonprofit children's theater here in Bellingham, Washington. I think there's a, something for every child in theater. Theater is about people sharing who they are, and even if the child standing up there doing the dialogue isn't telling a story about their own life, they're telling you something about themselves because they're standing up there in front of you. You know, and um, I think anytime a human being in our society steps forward and says, hi, this is me, I'd like to tell you a little about myself. I think that it's our duty to listen to that person. I was really shy at first, but I felt just not shy on stage, so I felt like this was home. If it hadn't been for Bay, I wouldn't have known anyone at high school. I would have been lost. Being part of theater it builds your confidence in speaking in front of other people. Bay has become a ginormous part of my life, and I don't know what I'd do without it, and I'm so thankful that it's been here for me. They want to be a part of a team, but they don't necessarily want to compete. And there's not a lot of opportunities like that out there for kids. Um, theater is, is what it is, you know. They get together, they work on a project, and everybody wins at the end of it. Creation and innovation, the, the fact that they're like building these scenes from scratch and doing their own costumes and character background and that kind of stuff. How would you be a better person now if someone had given you an opportunity back then? You know, I just think that we're giving future adults an opportunity to know that they can do things. And when you stand there and you listen to these kids do what they do on the stage, I, I look at the faces. You know, people just come alive inside and they are connecting on a, on a very deep level. It's a wonderful thing. You come out of here with a glow. So. It's good for you. Western Washington University senior Peter Bueller performs many tasks as part of his job at the Bellingham Sportsplex, but none is more interesting than cutting the ice. Bueller's official title is Zamboni Maintenance, and he is in charge of the most important role in any ice rink driving the Zamboni. If the competition weren't so tough, he'd probably move to Canada. You know, I remember like going to a few hockey games as a kid and like talking about like, oh, like, you know, like what it'd be like to be the Zamboni driver. It drives for the most part like a car does. I mean, it's, it's a little different from that. So to actually drive the thing, you can basically hop on it and do it. But to learn all the controls and stuff, I probably came in like three or four times a week for a couple of weeks until I could finally do all of it like on my own. 
I've been working there for about six months now. Of course, like any job, there's parts of it that I enjoy more than others. But um, yeah, I, I really like it. I mean, how many people get to say they drive a Zamboni? And also driving the things funner than it looks. Okay, one time when I was learning to drive it, I uh, thankfully I saved it, but it was very scary. I didn't turn quite soon enough because one of the things you, that happens if you stop on the ice with the water still running out back, it'll just melt a huge slot into the ice and totally ruin it. And it takes like at least like a day to fix, basically. So. Thankfully, I was smart enough to turn the water off and pull the conditioner up and back up and keep going. And it worked out fine, but like, I think that was after I was only working there like a month. I was like, I got off the zip and I was like, okay, 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 okay. You get used to the cold, but it's um, especially when it's already freezing outside, and all my roommates are cheapskates, so my house is freezing anyways. <laughs> so I'm just like living my life in an ice box. <laughs> life is cold. If it was just driving the Zamboni, I could totally see myself doing that. Hell, maybe I'll be like doing it for an NHL rink someday, right? That's the dream. I'm gonna go to Canada. Except there's probably like way more Zamboni drivers per capita in Canada, you think? So, maybe not to Canada. <laughs> I don't know where, but somewhere. I'll move somewhere. Somewhere with a bigger ice rink. That's it for this episode of Western Window. Be sure to tune in next time as we explore our world at and around Western Washington University. Western Window is proud to partner with the following student publications. Clipson Magazine is published twice each quarter and includes features, multimedia, and issues that affect lives across the greater Bellingham area. You can find it online at clipsonmagazine.com. The Western Front is the official newspaper of Western Washington University, published by the Student Publications Council and funded by your advertising dollars. The Western Front. Get it first. Get it right at westernfrontonline.net. The Planet is Western Washington University's award-winning quarterly environmental publication and the only undergraduate environmental magazine in the United States. Explore the Planet online at planet.wwu.edu.